This sounds really strange up here because I think the speaker's in front of me. Get everybody here okay? Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, we're going to pass the mic around. But, uh, thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, I am Chad Person. I'm one of the co-founders of Bowtie. Uh, also here, Jason Waldrop, the CTO of Brand Folder, and Matt Bogles, who's a designer. Uh, are you the lead designer for Webflow? Uh, I handle a lot of the education. But... Today you're the lead designer. Yeah, He's the lead designer of Webflow. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, both amazing guys. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of an introduction to what the topic of this conversation is. And just so you know, uh, you know, we pitched this idea, or well, actually, um, I was having a conversation a couple of months ago with Drew, who puts on the conference, and uh, you know, we were drinking whiskey and just talking about the act of creation, right? And effectively, so so I fall kind of on the designer front end spectrum. Uh, I'm also a fine art like fine artist by trade. And I've, I say pretty frequently that I've been fortunate enough to make my entire career uh, making things and making creative decisions for a living, which is pretty awesome. And so I'm hanging out with Drew one night and we're drinking whiskey and we were talking about, you know, kind of front end development in the age of like tools that scaffold you and get you really, really far. You know, and, and beyond kind of modular development, but this concept that like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna build a React app and I'm, I'm literally gonna like rebuild Instagram in three hours. You know, based on a tutorial and like installing a bunch of modules and like I'm up and running and now I can style the thing. And what what does that mean and how does that impact the decisions that we make uh, as creators? And I think like three more whiskeys in it became really philosophical and we were talking about this action of creation in general and like how does that affect not just you know writing apps or software or doing design, but you know what does it mean if I'm you know if I'm an artist or I'm a creator and consistently standing on the shoulders of giants. If I have the world's knowledge in my pocket, you know, does it ever actually stop me from making something? Because I have an idea and I go, oh, I, I do a quick Google search and I see that already exists. Or does, you know, me, uh, you know, and, and probably most of you here are, are creators on one level or another, my design process kind of looks like this. You know, I start with the problem, whether it's objective or subjective, and, you know, I analyze the problem a little bit, and then I do a research task where I try to get a feel for, you know, these like budding ideas that I have in my head and like what solutions may already exist out there, how they're practiced. And then I do a little bit of inward experimentation and start kind of messing around and playing around, you know, kind of in a, a closed environment. And then I take that to outward experimentation where I start sharing my ideas, right, with other people. Uh, maybe actually do some, some real user testing, do some validation, and then roll that back into finally calling the thing done, right? And when that thing is done, like whose work is it? Like right now, today, if I went out to design, you know, a, a brand identity for somebody, uh, I'm going to do a heck of a lot of research from the perspective of not just like visual research and see what other kind of similar brands exist, but I'm going to do patent research and trademark research, and I'm going to get a real feel for the market before I ever start making marks on a piece of paper or on a computer. Uh, so at the end, you know, when I finish this thing, how much input is there that isn't mine? You know, is it my work? How do we credit the people that come before us? Is it our work collectively? Yeah, and what does that mean in terms of the impact of like the next 50 years or 100 years of design and development? You know, we're doing work for hire, which is something that our country, our, our company is very much engaged in. Because Boat has a platform for uh, developers who are building sites to, you know, work for hire to hand off to non-technical users, right? Uh, that's been happening since the time that you know, the internet was born. And it's probably going to continue in one form or another. And there have been many, many, many products that have come before us, and there will be many, many products afterwards. But yet we're still pursuing that path. And I think we're making really interesting work and we've seen bounce forward. So uh, all that said, that, that's kind of the purpose of the discussion. And we're super fortunate to be joined by these guys. Uh, I'll give you my introduction to both of them. So I think, you know, as I mentioned, Matt, we designed the book. Uh, he is, he's a really fascinating developer, designer, and uh, I love the super high energy, and he has some really, really interesting ideas about um, effectively the depth of design and where design intersects the uh, development, which I think is something that you'll all get a real kick out of. Jason, uh, absolutely one of the smartest people that I know here in Denver, and I love Jason because he's super opinionated on everything, but he has this breadth of experience that he actually gets to speak from experience on all his opinions. So instead of being that guy who's like, yeah, 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 but let me tell you why stuff sucks. He'll be like, let me tell you why you know stuff sucks because I implemented it at scale and I'm throwing it away. But he's like, 
super sharp polyglot developer, uh, CTO of Granite Folder. Word on the street is he's basically he basically rescued that company and made it what it is today. So, uh, so with that said, I actually I'm gonna hand my mic over to these guys, let them talk a little bit about uh, the projects they're working on, what got them interested in this conversation, and then we we really like to just have kind of a dialogue and engage people in the audience as well. So if you want to come up, we don't even have to use the microphone. We can just you know shout at one another or whatever. Uh, and kind of talk about what making is and why we all do it. Uh, you know, just talk about what what interests you about this topic, like why why you're here with us. Sure. Um, so I got really interested in this talk. Um, Chad reached out to me about a week ago and um, asked if I was doing a talk at all Denver and said yes, and anybody would do another one. Of course, my hands were full enough already, but um, the topic really did interest me. Um, you know, kind of going back throughout history, I've worked with a lot of developers and designers who often ask the question, like, there's a gem for this, or there's, a, there's an app that already does this, so why, why reinvent the wheel? Um, you know, why rebuild this? Um, so that question gets asked quite a bit. Uh, and personally, my answer to that is, um, it's constant iteration, it's not iterate, like, it's iterating on other people's ideas as well as your own ideas. Um, you're taking what the rest of the world is doing. When you look at the world of social media and you look at companies like MySpace and the iteration of that was Facebook and you look at you know, FriendFeed and all these different versions of the same exact type of application, um, but really just iterate on the same similar idea of this social networking concept. And then even a step further is Ello, which is a company that's based out of Boulder, kind of took a completely different approach at it. And, you know, it worked for uh, the, that niche of people that wanted it that specific way. Um, so I think the reason that I constantly want to create things, whether it be, you know, a small open source project or a large application is, you know, you may be able to implement it better. And maybe not even just implement it, you might be able to market it better. Um, there's, a ton of, or there's a ton of companies out there that just have the ability to market and their connections are a, a lot better than other companies. And Salesforce is a great example. There's a myriad of other apps out there that are so much better than Salesforce, but Salesforce just has the market presence um, and the backing behind it to be as big as it has possibly is. So. As I was mentioned, I'm gonna, some of the same topics that made me interested in this talk as well. Um, my name is Max, I work at a company called Webflow, which kind of the goal from the beginning and really what it is today was to take designs, you know, especially web design, and put it in the hands of designers, not instead of developers, but to empower designers to build websites, uh, to design websites without writing code. Um, and what got me interested in this talk is that I think, as you mentioned, we see so, uh, the modular level of development is also the same with design. We see so many similar whether it's bootstrapped or frameworks or even just templates that we see all over the place now. We've seen this, what I like to call this fast food web design where there's this trend of everything looking and feeling the exact same. And uh, as Chad mentioned earlier, me kind of going on this rant of is design dead? Um, I think in web we're seeing that it is kind of, there's this decline, but then we oftentimes see these great websites. But I think where design can shine are in areas like creative thinking or product and I think what got me interested in this talk is to hear other ideas and thoughts around how we can escape this sense of, well, why would you recreate or reinvent the wheel when it already exists um, from a design level and push design further in this new world where things are changing all the time anyway. So. I got to say something. Design is great. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, thanks, yeah. um, so it's funny, this question of design being dead, particularly about the web. Does anybody feel like web design sucks right now? Like, raise your hand. Just okay, so does anybody remember what web design looked like five or six years ago before it actually intersected the quality that you can produce in print? Because for me, like five or six years ago, there was this amazing transition where suddenly web design, like websites were as flexible and amazing as like print, right? And that's still true. Now we can actually do even more, particularly with like what you can render in a browser uh, around animation. Like it's it's really amazing. But yet there's been this homogenization of design, yeah. right? And I think that gets to the heart of what we were talking about back today, which led to this discussion. It's like, you know, why is that? 
And, and I don't have the answer. I mean, is it just people taking the easy way out because somebody wrote a design framework called Bootstrap and it's really easy to implement? They're like, great, now I don't have to make those decisions. And does that ultimately hinder us or not? I mean, I think my, on my skeptical days, I personally feel like, you know, frameworks like Bootstrap have homogenized big chunks of the internet, right? But perhaps those big chunks of the internet would also be much uglier without it. And perhaps a framework like that lets somebody then think of design in, a, in the perspective of a framework. Like uh, another designer just introduced me to Tachyons a couple of weeks ago. Does anybody know Tachyons? It's kind of a, it's a similar design framework, you know, and it's very clearly uh, modeled after any other sort of like CSS framework, SAS based framework. Um, I don't think the author of Tachyons would have come up with that having not had the prior knowledge of what a design framework was. And I think that's probably going to help advance us forward, much like actually some of the things that I know Webflow's got like a, a sort of WYSIWYG CSS animation building tool, right? Um, you know, look at what's happening in CSS animation just in the last couple of years. Eventually, everybody's going to have too much movement and it'll be weird and we are going to want to rip it out. But I do think it helps move things forward uh, unfortunately, there's also going to be that big, like, middle of the over. So that's kind of my take on that. Like, I don't think design's dead. I think, I mean, shoot, man, I've seen some stuff on the web just in the last couple of weeks, uh, particularly, like, animation driven. And I was like, wow, this is just unbelievably gorgeous. Um, so. Yeah, I think the, the reason is, uh, if you think about it, how many people that need a website or want a website are actually capable of designing and building their own website? I think that, that percentage is probably very, very small. If you think of businesses, your mom and pop shop, your photographer, how many of those people can actually say, I'm going to design and build my own website and have it actually work and look good? I think that the percentage is very, very, very small. So then you have the people that are building websites are probably in a mix between big companies, but then You'll have agencies, or you'll have folks that don't know anything about web design, but they want a website, so they're going to turn to places like they're going to get a template, they're going to go to Squarespace, they're going to go to Weebly, they're going to go to these WYSIWYGs where they're going to get something that looks exactly the same, and and that's on their side, on Squarespace and, uh, and Weebly, it, it wouldn't make sense for them to necessarily build these very complex websites, because most of the people that are going that route don't really need a complex website. And then if you have an agency, from a cost standpoint, it also doesn't make sense for the most part to spend a lot of time building these very complex websites. Then again, you do have amazing, amazing work being done by large agencies for companies like Nike or uh, some of these amazing companies where I agree web design is probably more beautiful than ever in that extent, where there's this small percentage of the web that is doing things that we've never seen before that are absolutely amazing. I think the push that we're hoping to see is that we see more and more of that. And I think that it's going to kind of maybe piggyback on these frameworks, because obviously we've seen an evolution where these frameworks have caused more people or have pushed more people to get into web and have allowed people maybe even five years ago wouldn't have been able to do anything to now at least take a stab at it. And I hope that in the next five years we're going to see more and more people, that percentage of people, like I said, that can actually do this right now widen so that we can see some of these creative creative things that simply right now are, are left to either you know template builders or people that don't necessarily know how to do it themselves. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, one of the things that we were talking about the other day was um, with this abundance of tooling around design and development, uh, one of the fears that I've always had is kind of the death of the craftsman um, in this field and now that I think about it, now kind of hearing your points, maybe that's that's not what's going to happen, but maybe what's going to happen is, or maybe what's already happening is, there's just a lot more noise, and um, it makes it hard to kind of identify clear clarity in that ocean of noise. Um, I mean, certainly from my uh, perspective, interviewing developers, interviewing designers, you've got a lot of people who are coming in um, and no bootstrap, or no Rails, or no Node, um, and they have the ability to implement those things. Uh, and they might be really, really good at implementing those things. Uh, but when it comes down to it, like it's really hard to find the outliers. And sometimes like the outliers that could possibly be a lot better um, than what they're doing just kind of settled on implementing Bootstrap or implementing these things. And especially in a code test scenario or a design test scenario, they're, they're going to use the tools at hand um, to make sure that they can deliver as quickly as possible 
result that shows you uh, as a hiring manager that they're the best person for the job, which in a lot of cases is implementing a website using Bootstrap, which is what every other developer does, and it's really hard to tell whether or not they're better than anyone else. So maybe it's not the death of the craftsman in this field, although I think that's kind of partially happening as well because people are just coping with these tools that they have, uh, but it's also um, the ability to find those outliers. And I think those outliers will be, uh, will excel far more than the previous outliers. Now there's still people who are still implementing websites in basic HTML and don't know even what the hell Bootstrap is, um, but you know, it's just how it falls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I'm sitting here thinking, and also personal response to what you were talking about, because so we, we don't build a DIY website building tool. We build a tool for people who are doing work for hire, right? That's what Bowdine is. Um, and we also do some consulting, and you know we help people produce MVPs. Like I had a really interesting conversation with a young woman today who's she's working on funding and she's working on a social media play. And it's effectively, you know, when distilled, it's in her own words, kind of like Facebook, but just for women and women who want to have like really intimate conversations. And you know, my first thought is like, wow, you know, like, that's an interesting. Maybe she's got an angle to market this better, or maybe there's, maybe this is an interesting like niche that can be pulled away from you know the massive social media networks, kind of like LO, right? Um, it's it's entirely possible, but it's also entirely possible that she's reading on the wheel. Uh, should she not pursue it? You know, like it, it's it's one of these things where I kind of feel like part of the problem of this abundance of knowledge is the fact that so many things are DIY, right? And DIY definitely creates a lot of noise, you know, because if anybody, like, does anybody here do, uh, like, raise your hand if you actually build things for the web professionally. Like, I mean, pretty much most over here, right? So, so just thinking out loud here, but, um, you know, in like the DIY spectrum, like, I've met so many small business owners over the years who have gone through, like, tool after tool trying to build their own website until they finally, like, hire somebody. Right? And then they get something great, and lo and behold, it becomes a real asset for their business. Uh, you know, or like writing their own copy until they finally hire a copywriter. You know, or producing their own logo until they finally like, get a logo and, and hopefully they don't buy it in fiber. This does belong to something else. Uh, but you know, like it. So so maybe part of it's that, and then I think part of it is like, I, and I've experienced this myself. There's definitely an intimidation factor. When you have this idea, you know, and, that, and that's why I give credit to this young woman I spoke with today, right? Like, shoot, I mean, if I woke up tomorrow and thought, you know, my best move is like basically re rebuild Facebook for, you know, guys in their mid 30s that, you know, like rock climbing. You know, like that's a bold pursuit when you really think about it. Like, you've got to have crazy balls to go after that. You've got to really believe in your ability to like execute on that idea. When you're making something, it seems like not only is it there, but it's there in like 15 different flavors already. And so, like, so much credit, I give so much credit to the people that do that when we are walking around with like this, all this noise, right? And so, um, so yeah, that's, I, I love that because I think that's, that's the same kind of thing that people who, who uh, create for a living have been doing forever. Um, you know, and it's true, like, oftentimes when you think about, uh, even especially because I come from the arts like art history, most of the great works of art, you know, like, go back to the Renaissance, you know, go back to, like, you know, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. Like, that was work for hire. That was a commission that I'm sure he had to outbid other people to get. And he was probably, like, the number two guy, and there were probably people that were, like, I, you know, I don't know, but, you know, Michelangelo, he's a really good sculptor, so he can probably paint. And an interesting thing about Michelangelo, if anybody here has studied art history, is, he actually never considered himself a painter, and he sort of like did that work because it paid the bills. But when he would sign his name, he would write like Michelangelo, he was sculptor, you know, because he didn't want to be known as a painter. And like, who here thinks of sculpture for Michelangelo? I mean, he, he made David, right? Like the classic David that everybody knows. It's an icon, one of the most iconic artworks. We've been talking about it for another thousand years uh, in humanity. But also, like most people, default to the Sistine Chapel. Um, you know, he didn't do that as like a rogue, independent, creative. He did it on somebody else's dime in a very subjective context with like very specific missions and what he was trying to achieve and the messaging and the iconography and like, 
I, I don't know. I, those are the kind of things that I think when I sit down and make something, and I have that moment where I get intimidated, I'm like, crap, somebody already booked Facebook. You know, or like, yeah, this logo looks really similar. Like, we get that all the time with our logo. Uh, you know, there are a lot of similar logos. There's a reason. This is a Unicode symbol, which actually, like, influences the message of the brand, right? And we don't own it, and we'll never own it. And I love that about it. You know, and, and I love that I can type it. And people will come to us and be like, oh, I saw this company called Misfit Clothes, and their logo looks like yours. And I'm like, so? You know, like, that's okay. It works great for both times. Anyway, I'll stop talking. Yeah, you brought up some good points. Um, so, you know, you talked about this one who wanted to recreate a version of Facebook. Um, we talked about Michelangelo. And we talked, you know, I think some of the things you uh, were referencing is what drives people. So, what drove her to create this Facebook clone? Um, you know, what drove Michelangelo to be the Sistine Chapel? To pay the bills or to, you know, if he didn't want to be a trainer, maybe that's what it was. It was just a commission. Um, so, it, it begs the question. What drives us to create? For me, I mean, it's even if something is already out there. Part of my drive to create something is to learn, uh, to to get a better understanding. Even if someone already built this, you know, project or library or gem, whatever it was, recreating that um, gives me unique insight to how to implement something like that. You know, it's it's kind of the craft. It, you know, we talk about craftsmen, and if you talk about a person who creates chairs for a living. Uh, you know, are they going to go buy, if, if that's their job, are they going to go buy a chair, are they going to build a chair, if they need like six chairs for their living room. Um, so it's, it's kind of like what drives you, and that person to get to that point, in order to do that, he had to probably make a thousand chairs to get as good as he was to make that specific chair. He could have just coped and said, I'm just going to buy chairs, there's no reason for me to do this, but he's a craftsman. So, you know, the, the craftsman argument is, I think, is really important. You know, why do you design, why, why do I develop? Uh, and not just use existing applications that are out, that are out there. Uh, and there's even programming languages that are specifically designed to where you can literally drag and drop components and not have to write a specific piece of code. Uh, and there's website builders that do the same thing. And yes, I could probably get the same exact result um, that I would get had I just coded it by hand. But I didn't learn anything about it. And part of the drive for me is learning. Well, I think I think that's that's very very true. I love the. I think we're always we're consistently trying new things because we want to learn new things, and we're always I think we're curious because we know that there's probably a better way to do this because we've kind of grown in an age where we've always figured out there's a better way to do something. Um, you talked about drive. I think from a design perspective, I think one of the things that when I talk to a lot of designers, we we like to build things that people enjoy using, but also I think the same with development is we're trying to solve complex problems or make things that were once complex and turn them into something that's easy. Uh, like, you know, handling a cab used to be maybe not a huge pain in the ass, but enough to where we were like, we should put it on our phones, and it, it turns into obviously a great you know, billion dollar industry. And I think that the funny thing is when I see so much more with design now, especially on web and product as well, but we think of it in what is the end goal, if we're always trying to drive results. And I think it's, it's way worse, like I said, with like a website because it's, if you're in the room with, you know, manager of business or marketing, it's, uh, well, how are we going to drive more clicks and conversion and all these metrics come into play? So I kind of went back to my original topic of seeing over and over again the same styles and designs and things. It's, in some cases, we're feeding off the habit that we already have. And I think that as much as we want to try to reinvent the wheel and do all these new and creative things, uh, I was at a conference last week in DC with some of the, the people that invented like, responsive web design, and they, were, they did tons and tons of experimentation on what happens when they were to you know, alter the design to make it more of a print oriented or, and look more beautiful. And the end result was that the users had no idea what to do. And they, it was a poor user experience because, yeah, the site looked great, but they didn't know where to go. They didn't know what to click. The navigation was on the bottom of the page where it should be on the top of the page. Like We expect these things if you go to websites where we we've kind of develop these habits, even when we use our products. It's you know, apps, like all these different things, they rely on the same mechanics for a reason. So. I think a lot of it, as much as we really try to push the needle and create all these new things, I mean, sometimes, I know I do when I design, I feel limited in that I feel like I need to make sure that I'm still abiding by all these quote unquote rules of you know, design where I know that users know how to use it this way because that's how you know, X, Y, and Z have used it. So we don't want to you know, steer too far from that. But at the same time, I think the battle is we want to create something new, we want to do something new, uh, we want it to look pretty, uh, all these different things, but at the same time, I think that's what 
drives me as a designer is some of those constraints make it actually more challenging and fun. I'm sure it's the same with development where you kind of walk this line of, yes, I want to create something new all the time, but I have to understand that I have to make sure the end product is you know, easy to use, good to use, it's scalable, all these different things. And then when you're making business decisions, now even when we were just at the happy hour for this talking about, well, if you use this new framework, and it's like, well, is it, I understand that new frameworks are fun and exciting, but I've seen so often where you jump on something new and it, it'll end up going up in flames and you waste actual real business dollars. And there's a responsibility to your employees and all these different things. Um, so I guess there is, I mean, we're talking about how you know, all these frameworks and how sometimes they can pull this down, but I think there is, in some cases, a way that we've become so used to them that even our users are used to them, and there's some reason why maybe sticking to them isn't you know, an awfully bad idea. Not that we shouldn't iterate, we should, but there is still some use cases to using them, unfortunately. <laughs> Do you want to get anyone from the audience to hear their feedback? Yeah, I'd love to. Hey, does anybody, can you guys can come up too if you want, but like, does anybody have an opinion to share on something that's going on? Uh, as I hear you talk about this, I keep thinking about uh, like the auto industry. They have these car shows where they do these almost one-off things that are so far to the extreme. They're great. They're fantastic. They're creative, but they're not what they do day to day. They can't. It's it's just not something that gets done. And I feel like a lot of what you know what we do is that. You know, you've got these things that are new and exciting, but yeah, they don't work. They're not day to day things. There's so few people that could afford them that could use them that it doesn't make sense. You know, from a standpoint, I think that's kind of where we get bogged down. I mean, the vast majority is we're in this middle spot. You know, we're making stuff that's practical, not yeah. stuff that's exciting. Yeah. So, question about that. So, so why do you think, uh, in your mind, specifically the auto industry, uh, why do we have these immense spikes of you know innovation or prototypes, and then what drives them back down in your mind to going back to just delivering the 2017 version of the you know, Acura LSX or whatever. You know, I think I think they they use that you know technology they create the new things they created. They can take elements from it, but it's a very slow process. I think a lot of those things wind up eventually, and I think a lot of the websites that you see that are really exciting and interesting and new and you see, that is really cool. Eventually, they wind up you know somehow elements of that getting pulled into a. A website, but it's experimentation. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Some of it's practical, some of it's not. Sure. And I think that's kind of what we see with a lot of the websites too. I mean, you get some really cool stuff out there, but it's, it's not practical. It's not going to run on things that people you know use day to day. It's not you know it's not easy to use. The user experience is not good. But there are elements that maybe you can pull from. It. So I think it's good. You know, it's I love seeing those sites, but a lot of times it's it's just not practical. I think everybody wants to work on that. I mean, that's, 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 that's the problem, you know. If, if everybody had their way, they, you know, it might be interesting. We might do that stuff, but yeah, what would be a different piece sure, than that? Yeah. If every website was different, yeah. exactly. it's it's a challenge. Yes. Yeah, I think there's kind of a, another parallel there. So, like the recreating Facebook projects and uh, like recreating, say, a, your uh, your Acura LSX, right? There's so much iteration that's gone into that, that current version of Facebook with the Acura OS X that you're you have to throw away a lot. It's going to constantly do something so it's throw away. Yeah. Uh, so there, there's just an investment factor that I think has a lot to do with this. Yeah. Yeah, I've had clients actually ask about can we make this like Facebook for yeah, for dentists or whatever. <coughs> and yeah, they, they just balk when they finally hear what it actually takes to get to the point where Facebook is and where they can and not, not only that, but what goes on behind the scenes, like collecting data, or in your accurate, you know, that uh, adjust compression at different speeds, right? Like, right, right? There's just a lot. Building on top of the market way. research and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah, I mean, especially, uh, you know, I, I was just thinking, I, I like the automotive analogy too, because, you know, for I don't know however many years they've been out in the market. Like I really, really wanted to go buy a Tesla because, god damn, like at the top end, like I, I got to drive one once. It was like the best driving car I'd ever driven. Like throws you back in your seat. It has so much torque. And now that they're coming out with like a thirty thousand dollar model, it's becoming attainable, yeah. right? But it's also way less sexy. Yeah. Right. Still less yes. interesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know. 
don't let, uh, and $30,000 is probably really like $50,000. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are probably people who are doing really, really boring jobs at Tesla and making a million compromises because they have to make the bottom line or because they're like, yeah, I would love to spend an extra three days on this, but I just can't. Because it's got to get out the door. Oh, yeah. There's also a lot of value in that, right? Yeah, it's got to be the stuff that, that they nailed down in those, those higher end vehicles that is, is repeatable, that they can yeah. do it quickly. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the auto industry is, especially because I think we're, we're becoming spoiled with software because we constantly see it coming out with new stuff all the time. We're thinking of the auto industry where when you look outside, there's cars everywhere. We're, we're surrounded by cars, yet manufacturing is so, so much more expensive. Like, could you imagine if, if there was every year there was like a new car update and everybody you know, snapped their fingers and everybody got a new car? Um, what a different world that would be. And you mentioned Tesla, I was going to mention Tesla as well, where I think his whole, when Elon's master plan is to literally take that whole process and start with very expensive cars, but use that to fund the next model that goes down and down and down to a point where eventually, hopefully, it becomes much cheaper, but hopefully at that point we're driving or, you know, we're teleporting or something like that anyway. But I do think that the auto industry is such a, it's such an interesting, interesting piece, because yeah, we still see technology I mean, I don't know if I've ever, ever seen a well-designed interior of, as far as like navigation and UI, it's the, it's the most ugliest thing. Um, and they spend millions and millions of dollars developing it. And I think it's just, uh, I hope that we can bring these practices of in the, you know, software and iterative design in, uh, into things like manufacturing, because I think there's so much to learn there. But. I have this vision of Tesla eventually coming out with the Prius. I mean, that's, that's what they're talking about doing. They're trying to get down to a car that's right. and as each generation gets closer to that, you look at it and go, that looks more like cars I've already seen. Right. And, 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 and they might act there. They might get beat to the punch by Toyota yeah. or Audi or any other bigger player and you just throw a lot more manufacturing quite behind it and saturate the market before yeah. I spend my 30 man on a Tesla. But you know, to that same argument, um, Tesla in the very beginning actually treated cars more like software than any other company. I mean, not, not only the software in the car, but you know, they would come out, you know, there was a couple of cars that caught on fire because the yeah. batteries got punctured underneath. They're like, hey, if you've got a Tesla and it doesn't have this, bring it in, we'll hold it on for you. Yeah. It's like add-on updates for cars and that's treating it like software. I don't think they're going to do that with Model 3. They've obviously worked out a bunch of kinks, but yeah. they definitely did innovate very quickly, even having existing on-the-road models, yeah. which is something that no other car and the software ever done. updates and everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you like it, yeah. zero to sixty. They're like, oh yeah. By the way, the latest software update: zero to sixty in two point nine yeah, exactly. seconds. Yeah. <laughs> and I wonder if that some of the next big ideas that we see in the world are going to be where we think of things that we use every day. I mean, like Nest Thermostat is always a great example where we took something that was just the most boring thing you could possibly think of, rapid, something that's enjoyable to use, and had technology behind it and software behind it, and all of a sudden it's it's incredibly attractive. Right? I think right. there's so much potential to I want everything around us to add that sense of. Yeah. The philosophy to it. Okay, I have a question, and I'd love to hear anybody's. Right? So here's a question, and I'd love to hear anybody's response to this. But you know, kind of taking from what you guys are saying and what I'm saying, it sounds like so as makers, we're all making things, and most of us make things for a living, right? Uh, part of the problem is sometimes you have to ship something you have to make, and so we rely on tools because we can move faster, or we can move more efficiently, or more profitable, or we're chasing something to the bottom. You know, like the Tesla Dream. Everybody can have one of these. They're just not going to have the one that was like super cool, right? Uh, our problem is the, the noise from DIY, you know, and the fact that that's actually sort of homogenized things. So I think the question I have is how and where can we do our best work? You know, if you're going to like, you know, you sit down and learn a new framework or you decide like, like where, where do you do your best work, Jason? Like what's your What's the opportunity for you to sit down and be like, you know what, I'm going to put my best self forward in this thing that I'm about to create? Yeah, I mean, that's a, so um, for me, that's, that's identifying areas that don't have a lot of noise. Um, so, you know, I, I try to learn at least a new language every year. Um, and they're typically languages that are not, you know, I'm not learning Java or C or COBOL going back and the oldest languages that have ever existed. Um, but I'm learning new languages that have, you know, React is fairly new, although, you know, it's obviously caught on like wildfire. Um, there's still a lot of, it's still in its infancy. 
and there's still a lot of room to innovate and create new tools and plugins and uh, things that no one, no one else has ever done in React. And then there's new languages coming out, you know, Go and Crystal and Nim and these new things. And you know, they may not be things that take off and become huge, but those, the creators are the ones that flock to those things really early on. It's not until later that you have all the people that have participated in the noise uh, that are eventually going to see you know, the creators in those areas and say, oh, well, you know, looks like a lot of people have done this, so now we're going to kind of migrate to this new framework, we're going to migrate to this new language, whatever it may be, uh, the noise comes later. So if you can identify those greenfield areas, uh, and I think the same is true for design and art, um, those certainly exist, although you know, maybe they don't evolve as quickly as they do as, uh, in development. Um, but they are there, and I think that's the place for us as creators to kind of go and set, uh, set the standard uh, for other people to come in. And I, I'm not discouraging people who want to participate in noise not to come into that space and, sure. and contribute and use the tools that we've created, uh, but someone needs to go there and create those, those frameworks and those tools to begin with. What was, the, what was the original question? What inspires like, me like, like, where do you get to do your best work? When, how, how do you push yourself so that yeah. you can do something that you feel absolutely great about? I think that I love the idea of going where there's where there's not a lot of noise because I think that there's typically that means that you can allow, there's that's where creativity is because there's not a lot of structure or rules and you can kind of make your own rules in those areas. So definitely, I definitely like that. And also think that those areas tend to be where. There's so much opportunity. Um, there was a great, uh, I can't remember what the actual term is called, but it's like uh, the pike mentality or some sort of, something with a pike. And basically it goes around this idea that um, scientists did this experiment where they had a pike and you know, minnows, and they would drop the minnows inside of the aquarium and the pike would immediately go and grab them. They would eat them and, and that's what it eat. And then eventually what they did is they put a glass barrier between the pike and the minnows, and the pike went up and tried to eat the minnows, and he didn't see the glass, and just kept banging his head against this glass, trying to eat it. Eventually it stopped. It realized, I'm not gonna get to these minnows, I'm not gonna eat it. They released the glass, and the minnows swam free around the pike, and the pike never, ever ate them ever again. And I think that what we end up, that's kind of, to me, that's the noise. It's this idea where we, we tend to focus on things consistently, but then we kind of get these habits of, oh, that's good, we don't need to focus on it anymore, we've solved it. But eventually, we have to be the pipe that goes, wait a second, like I eat minnows, I'm gonna start eating these again, and kind of open up things that we didn't think about before. Um, and so hearing you talk about that, I think that's where, that's what drives me, is trying to figure out all these areas where maybe we've kind of, we've come accustomed to you know, we're not eating those anymore because maybe for the longest time we realized maybe that was a problem, we stopped eating them, whatever it was, but there's still so much opportunity for those to be discovered, and I think that's where I end up doing some of my best work is finding those, but then exploring them uh, once you kind of find them. What about anyone from the audience? I'd love to hear kind of about, you know, your creative process or like where or maybe a recent anecdote of like where you did work that you were like super proud of or solved a project problem that you were like, yeah, I really kicked ass on that or something. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Speaking of your last comment, uh, I think JavaScript, you know, since yeah, CS6 has come out, we've been seeing a lot of new, lot of new methods and been covered by polyphones. That's been an area that I've been able to pull myself in and get excited about doing you know, dumb things like, uh, I don't know, uh, it's, Funny, uh, doing rain, you know, using just yeah, sure. stress methods. Uh, getting, pulling low dash out, like, it's super dumb and maybe a little bit of a waste of time, but I definitely sharpen my skill a little bit, and I feel good about, I don't know, getting new actual work instead of just work. I think one of the other ones for me is where the expectations are released. That's really where you don't have all of these, these things, these expectations, it's got to be this, it's got to be this, it's got to be this. You mean like how? how yeah, you where you, where you get kind of small requirements, you know, where the customer and the client really doesn't know what they want exactly, and, and they've got a very, you know, I want better or something. Um, you try to tease out what you can to get it, but the, the less expectations, the easier it is to, you know, yeah. put your own mark on it. You know, you really have the opportunity to to do something when somebody wants, you know, I want it to look like this, I want it to look like Bootstrap. You know, you, you're kind of limited in what you can do. So. Sure. Yeah, that's really
Yeah, well, any, so any questions or thoughts from, uh, from anyone? I mean, anything related to the topic at all, like this is kind of our window for we let this last 15 minutes of the discussion. So I went to a, you know, if you were all called out of CMS meetup last night. It was rather interesting. I've been working with Juno and Drupal and WordPress. What was interesting is uh, one of this guy, Andy Miller, who was working with Joomla 10 years ago, he's created a new CMS, Grab CMS, and it doesn't even use a database. So I mean, if you're familiar with content management systems, uh, Linux is what I'm talking about, yep. uh, Linux, Apache, MySQL. And, uh, so I think mean, maybe sometimes things get loaded. Um, I also they gave a presentation about Sitecore, which I had no experience with. And it's huge. It comes with all this stuff, and like, and it costs money. You know, I used to, you know, download my Joomla and I'm ready to go. So, um, so that might be a good reason to start over is start with a clean slate and, and um, sweep all of that old junk away. Sweep away your database. I mean, they're almost doing that kind of with Mongo. It's compared to SQL, it's a minimalistic type thing. From what I understand. All right, that's just a problem. I gotta throw my two cents in because a big part of Bowtie is actually I have the CMS that's database free as well. And it's so we talk about this all the time. Um, yeah, the lamp stack, like 15 years ago, I mean shoot, when I discovered like Drupal and WordPress, I was like, oh my god, this is the most amazing thing. Like I don't have to write the same code over and over to, to produce a complex website with lots and lots of content. And then, you know, we're we're basically still stuck on that paradigm. Right? Like 15 years later, we're stuck on this paradigm that, you know, it's because I can do a one-click install from HostGator, I might as well just start with WordPress and then see if there's like a theme out there that I can adapt. And then basically live with a whole bunch of crap that has nothing to do with my content that's making my site bloated and insecure and, and problematic actually for my visitors. Um, yeah, I, I love the kind of stuff that you can now render client-side. With JavaScript and using like flat file CMSs, you know, like you said it was Grab, right? And you know, yeah, Grab. Yeah, yeah like Grab. Grab is a very cool tool. Uh, you know, the kind of stuff that we're doing with Bowtie, we're basically that that I think is a key paradigm shift and is going to change the way that websites are built, at least the underlying technology that they're built on. Uh, design, I'm going to leave up to you in that yeah, and see how that goes. But uh, but yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, mean, I think that's a great example of. Um, why are we doing that now? You know, why does Grab exist? Why are these headless CMSs becoming popular and people are starting to toss away their database-driven sites? Because they've become, not only are they, uh, you know, like is, is that kind of paradigm failing us? You know, they've just become so commonplace that it's like, I think people decided to, to sort of evolve forward. You know, and in that, there's not really a lot of new technology, but just enough that it's a cleaner, better way to produce content. On the web. So. Uh, yeah, any, anybody else have a, a cool story like that? Or something to share? Or, you know what I'd love to hear is like, can anybody just talk about, you know, their, like, because this is one of those things, I guess I didn't really share this anecdote earlier, but I'll tell you one of my favorite stories and then maybe I'll hear something somewhere. Um, so, I think I've been addicted to the internet since I first saw Yahoo, which like blew my mind uh, on a tour in my. Like, um, high school, but we toured a college campus that had Yahoo in the library. Um, so, you know, I'm just constantly like staring at other people's stuff all day and night. Uh, and, you know, I mentioned before that I went to art school. And I remember when I, so I got my MFA, and I was coming up with all sorts of different ideas for my thesis. And I had, a, like, I don't know what, but I, I like scrolled myself away, and I had this brilliant idea one day. And I woke up and I'm like, okay, I've got it. Like, this is going to be the most amazing MFA thesis. I'm going to run focus groups and figure out exactly the type of art that people want. And then produce that per spec. And like, just make, you know, and I, I don't paint, I've never painted art, but I'm like, I'm going to make fucking paintings that are exactly what people want and do like legitimate like market research and be like, here's your painting. And I brought that to my MFA advisor. And she was like, that is such an incredible idea. You should go check out Komar and Melanie because they've done that now in about like 27 countries. And the most amazing thing about it is all the paintings look the fucking same. <laughs> like it's a, and, and these guys, like, it's such great work. And it's such an incredible commentary on like, you know, the state of the human condition. It's almost exactly the same painting across like 27 different countries. 
it's a mountain and there's a lake and a river and there's usually some sort of wildlife in it, like a deer, you know, and then he gets to like Denmark and it looks like the screen. It's this weird abstract fucking thing and it's like the one outlier. And at that moment, like, I remember feeling so deflated and crushed. I'm like, oh, I can't do this. Like, I can't do it. Like, it was such a great idea. And I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I walk away from it. And now I wish I would have done it. I wish I would have just, like, done my own flavor of it. But I was, like, I was totally defeated. It was this younger version of myself. Um, now I see something that's similar. I'm like, cool. That's great. That's interesting. And I look for, like, the way that I can move past that. So. Um, does anybody have a story like that? Like, have you ever stopped yourself from making something because you saw somebody else have done it? I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. I have some feedback that kind of relates to that. I mean, you mentioned also earlier your logo process, and is it your own creativity, or am I really feeding from other people that did it before me, and is design dead? And all these things are just coming in circles because now the pretty websites are these full screen. <laughs> Beautiful sites, but ten years ago, people did that in Flash, right? And it was a beautiful full screen site, and it scrolled this way with parallax and things moved. It's the same stuff. It's just done in a new way now that is now responsive and worth the phone, right? But someone's taking credit for that, but someone else already did it. So you're just a stepping stone for the next thing, even though it's been done. You're just, just, it's kind of going. And it's just, I'm not trying to just feedback to what. Yeah, 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 it's interesting. It's like the creative expression piece of it hasn't really changed, but the underlying technology is there, and so people are figuring out a new way to say the same things usually, you know, like without Flash. Yeah, no, that's, so that's an example of it. Yeah, no, I've like seen that. that. People say, look at the site. I said, well, we did that 10 years ago. Yeah. Right. It's a different, same different. Yeah, yeah and, you know, certainly I think one of the things as a creator, is I dealt with that really early on in my career where if you have these great ideas and you're like, you want to implement them and people tell you, oh, that's already been done before. And really early on, that did discourage me. I would be like, oh, I'm not even going to do it. But as I advanced throughout my career, I found out that I should do those things. Like Even if it's the exact same result, you were just going to learn an immense amount of information um, on how to implement something like that. And most likely, the result is going to be better. I mean, you're going to want to iterate on whatever you just saw, and you're going to want to make your product better. Um, you know, and I wish I could go back and do those things that I let discourage me. And, and funny enough, you know, one of the things, uh, one of the ideas that I had seven or eight years ago, Facebook implemented something like it, but it never really went anywhere. I'm like, man, I just should have, I should have just done that, because like, they didn't do a good job doing it. I thought, oh my gosh, Facebook did it, so I guess I can't do it now. But it didn't go anywhere. The feature was like timelines, the idea of tracking your life. But like, really, everyone's life started between 2005 and 2011, when <laughs> I got on Facebook, and that's it. And like, no one went back to tell the story of the rest of their life. And that was the idea that I had: is like, how do we tell the story of someone's life? And I was so discouraged that Facebook announced this feature. But no one went to Facebook to do that in the first place. So no one really adopted the feature. And if I would have just built something specifically to do that, I would have been leaps and bounds ahead of Facebook. And they wouldn't have cared because that's not what they're trying to do. Um, maybe they would have bought me, which, you know, <laughs> would have been nice. But uh, you can't let those things discourage you. So I think that's really important as a creator. Um, I love I love that song because I hear it all the time where I think people get discouraged uh, for stuff like that and, and you mentioned I mean, design being dead kind of being a comment I I guess the way that I think design is dead not in the same way that it's it's disappearing but who here is a designer who would say that you're a good designer web designer awesome so I think the way that design I think is transforming and has kind of over the last ten years is it's less of making things look good. And it's, it's, be, it's grown so far beyond that where it's actually how do things work? How does a user go from point A to point B? It's how they actually use your products and your website. So I think that if you're a designer, there's probably never been a time in our history where design has been so important. And you can take something that's already existed for years, and even just a very recent one like Slack, where they didn't reinvent anything. Like chat has been around since we could start sending messages back and forth, but it's not, they didn't iterate. They iterated, they didn't reinvent something. But what they did is they made that entire experience that much better through 
design through speed, through better development, all these different things that they were to, to iterate on an update, I think that there's, yes, ideas are going to continue to come and go and everybody's going to have the same idea, but there's so many ways that you can either design or iterate or build it that could really be that change where somebody may be doing something right, but just by going in and changing Airbnb, another one, the, the ability to go and stay at somebody else's place was certainly not a new idea, but Airbnb came in and said, we're going to design it and present it in a way that makes it more exciting and actually kind of adventurous. And I think that's a great example of how design or thinking about something in a different way can completely change the outcome. So even when you find yourself thinking about something in the same way somebody else is already doing something around your same idea, always try to think that there could be a slightly different way of doing it or making it just that much better or even updating it. Because even if it's five years old, it can already be updated. And you mentioned you know, sometimes having to just completely put it under the rug. I think there's so much opportunity around those right now. And I think all you need is just to go in and take a new approach on it and you're holding. So. I think if you look at solving one extra pain point or fixing yeah. one extra problem, yep. Iterative becomes the new revolution, right? We don't, we don't push these revolutionary things out all the time, but if we solve one small thing, and I reinvent Instagram in the way that fixes one problem that I had, then I push the whole stack forward, right? And then you go, well, I have a different problem, and I may be coming, I get to learn all the lessons Instagram learned because they learned them publicly. And then I don't have the baggage they have because they came from where they came from. So I get to start in a fresh spot. And you said, let me do this thing my way, and let me fix this one problem. Right? And everything shifts forward. And maybe I do something that triggers something for someone else or unlocks another piece. Right? And then we just slowly roll forward. Yeah, I think that I mean like with Instagram, look like Snapchat. So like just it's a, they're solving kind of the same problem, but they're going at it at a completely different angle. I think one of the other things that we're gonna see just sort of the next I mean, going down into the future is just less and less of everything. It's how can we actually eliminate everything that we're doing and, and make it to where eventually I can just sit here and think about, you know, this talk's over in 10 minutes, my lips are on the way, and I don't have to pull up the phone. Um, I think gradually we're going to start thinking about things and how can we eliminate all these steps instead of adding things or taking away things. Um, it's going to be how can we actually shrink the process to, to have the same experience but shrink the process and not be up there. Another point that you made is um, revolution through iteration. Uh, and one of the things I was just thinking about is it's actually really hard for a company as established as Instagram or Snapchat to iterate. And sometimes that iteration has to come from a new product. You know, uh, People are so used to the way that Instagram works and changing something can significantly upset uh, a large percentage of their user base. So you know, that should encourage creators is to build an alternative, and that way, you know, people will start to kind of see a light in the new app and say, "Oh, this is kind of like Instagram, but I like it better for some reason." And now I'm going to start using this. I mean, Snapchat did that to Instagram. It's exactly what happened. Um, and now, you know, Instagram and Snapchat virtually are the same exact application. Um, if you open them up on your iPhone, they have the same features, same everything else. It's like the same thing, um, and everything drove in that direction. But it took and it, uh, someone to go above and beyond what Instagram was able to do and have a completely new user base um, and iterate from a completely outside perspective uh, to do something like that. And it's really hard to affect change from within. So. Yeah, okay. Okay, go ahead. yeah, just my, my thought on it too is like, I like this concept, iteration as a revolution because revolutions are reactive and iteration is also reactive. But then it makes me think, where do the big leaps come from, right? I mean, you know, you look at, uh, to the point of acquisitions, like WhatsApp, what, what was different about WhatsApp from any other messaging client that Facebook spent so much money buying them and couldn't attract those same users? Or, um, you know, for that matter, the Snapchat, Instagram, or I, I don't know, like, is it, I, I kind of wonder, you know, there wasn't like a major leap. So like Snapchat had a major leap, right? Uh, was it reactive to Instagram? Like the leap of like the disposing message, right? Like that was their like, step back. Yeah, sure. like you know, like make no it's just, Yeah, but but it was novel. And I remember when it came out, I was like, oh, this is novel. And you know, I don't interact with this thing like this, right? That's I wouldn't call that an iteration. 
You know, like I think that's something something special that somebody just had this idea one day there, and for, from whatever combination of, of uh, concepts and like that was it. That's all it took. And now they're virtually identical because I think it, you know Instagram iterated toward it. Um, you know, as Snapchat iterated back toward kind of more traditional features yeah, for like iteration. Like yeah, like they sort of meet in the middle. But it makes me wonder. Like iteration is a revolution. Yes, absolutely true in a lot of ways. Uh, and revolutions are entirely necessary and such a part of the human condition, you know, because we are reactive, we're a reactive species. But where does the productivity come, you know? Like, who, like how does that leap happen that, like, we're literally, you're just leapfrogging over, like, past, you know, past that minnow effect? Like, I'm not, like, slamming my head against the glass and reacting to the minnow, but I'm like, yeah, fuck the minnows. I'm gonna go see if I can eat this kale. Or whatever. I don't know. You know, I, I love, I, I'm going to look for that next time I sit down and do some work. It's a cool idea. Um, we're, you know what, we're actually out of time. We're over. But this has been so awesome. Thank you all. Really, 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 really.